I'd like to welcome each one of you back this evening. Again, thank you so much for joining us this weekend here at the State Line Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're this weekend studying about how we can be prepared for the harvest. And in our first study, we talked about a last generation, why? And in our second presentation now, we want to take a look at the question, why does 1888 matter? And let's go ahead and pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the privilege that we have to now consider your word and a little bit of Adventist history of the blessings that you have granted to this great Advent movement. And thank you for giving us the privilege of being part of it at the end of time. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Ella Preby, please share with us, why does 1888 matter? What do you think the most important year is for Seventh-day Adventism? 1844 or 1888? When God stepped into the Garden of Eden and said to the serpent, his seed shall bruise your head. Was that important? When Jesus uttered the cry on Calvary, it is finished. Was that even more important? You see, prophecies are important, but fulfillment is even more important. God gave prophecies to his remnant people, just a few scattered Millerites that came out of the great disappointment pointing them forward to what was ahead in 1844, a pathway to heaven, as the first vision described. But in 1888, I think he was planning to finish it up. Fulfillment, the promise experienced. Ellen White said that 1888 and that message was the loud cry of Revelation 18 to lighten the earth with its glory. That sounds like fulfillment to me. The loud cry. You'll find that in the 1888 materials, page 1575. She said this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, page 1336. There is not a point, she said, that needs to be repeated more frequently than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Well, that's the gospel. That was page 811. But there was resistance. Not all thought this was a great message. And she had a message for those as well. Here's what she said. Stand out of the way, brethren. Do not interpose be yourselves between God and His work. If you have no burden of the message yourselves, then prepare the way for those who have the burden of the message. Page 377. She was serious about this, apparently. And then she said, In rejecting the message given at Minneapolis, men committed sin. Pretty direct. Page 914. Elder A.G. Daniels, longtime president of the Adventist Church in the years following, in 1926 wrote a book called Christ Our Righteousness. Listen to what he said. It is difficult to conceive how there could be any misunderstanding or uncertainty regarding the heavenly endorsement of this message. It is of greater significance to the church at the present time than it could have been in 1888. The nearer we approach the great day of God, the more imperative will be the need of the soul-cleansing work which that message was sent to do. Surely, we have every reason for a new, whole, more wholehearted study and proclamation of that message. Christ our righteousness, pages 25 and 26. Well, do you think that applies even today in 2016? as well as 1926? I'm going to suggest something. If you're really serious about wanting to know what this message was that was to be the it is finished message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, 
the fulfillment of all the 1844 promises, I'm going to suggest a couple of books for you to read. Uh, the author of these books, his name uh, you're probably familiar with up here, is Ron Duffield. And I'm going to suggest that his books, in my opinion, have become the gold standard for anyone wanting to know what happened in 1888. What books are they? The Return of the Latter Rain, Wounded in the House of His Friends. Read those books, my friends, if you want to know what it is finished was to be in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Ron Duffield, The Return of the Latter Rain, Wounded in the House of His Friends, two different books. Well, the messages of elders Jones and Wagoner were all about the ability of the gospel to change one's heart and save from sin. Here's what Elder Wagoner wrote in his book, Christ and His Righteousness, pages 65 and 66. When Christ covers us with the robe of His own righteousness, He does not furnish a cloak for sin, but takes sin away. And this shows that the forgiveness of sins is something more than a mere form, something more than a mere entry in the books of record in heaven. What I'm going to do tonight for just a couple of minutes, I'm going to share with you just a sampling of what Elder Wagoner wrote about righteousness by faith in these messages. I found them in a rather new book called Living by Faith, finding some of his previously unpublished manuscripts, Living by Faith by E.J. Wagoner. Just a few samples. It can't be doubted that there is power in the Word of God far above that of any other book. The Word hidden in your heart protects from sin. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The Word has power to give life. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now that's Scripture, of course. How simple. There is in the Word that divine energy which can transform your mind and make you a new creation. Many people earnestly long for Christ to come and dwell in their hearts, and they imagine that the reason why He does not do so is because they are not good enough. And they vainly set about trying to get so good that He can condescend to come in. They forget that Christ comes into your heart not because it is free from sin, but in order to free it from sin. Christ is coming into your heart with the same power that created the worlds from nothing. Christ has met and overcome every obstacle that can possibly be brought against your humanity in the struggle against temptation. And therefore, in Christ, you have the victory. For when you are in Him, the temptations assail Him, and not you by yourself. When you hide your weakness in His strength, then His strength will fight the battle. What you have to do is to take the victory that has already been won, the victory that He gained. The glorious truth is revealed that the victory over every temptation and difficulty is already yours in Christ. Defeat cannot possibly be the outcome, no matter how formidable the foe may make himself appear. The battle is already fought, and Jesus holds out to you the victory. You have to simply take it and say, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I say, what a powerful gospel message that is. So different from the evangelical version of the gospel which is sweeping the Christian world and our Adventist uh, churches and schools. It is full of hope. It is full of courage. It is full of optimism because Christ is fighting the battle with us. Well, let's see, a little more, just as a sample. This does not mean that Christ's righteousness, which He did 2,000 years ago, is laid up for you to simply be credited to your account, but it means that His present active righteousness is given to you. Christ comes to live in you when you believe. So it will be seen that there can be no higher state than that of justification. It's an interesting point. The message of Jones and Wagner is not the message of the Reformers back in the 16th and 17th centuries, as important as those were, but goes beyond it. And I say far beyond it. 
Notice that over and over, justification is called making righteous, which flies in the face of most evangelical scholars and Adventists, some Adventist scholars today. It is common to say that justification equals forgiveness and sanctification equals power. We say that quite a bit. Their emphasis was on the power of justification, the power that comes with conversion at the moment of surrender. Justification changes us from the inside out, which is the greatest miracle of the gospel. Our outward actions are not the power of the gospel. The change in our heart is that power. And then sanctification follows naturally and easily as we understand and live that message. Another sample. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. It is evident that the Christian religion is a religion of the present tense. In the Christian life, nothing counts for anything except for the present. The new birth is a continuous process and thus something that is ever present. Many who profess to be Christians always look either to the past or to the future. Christianity in the present tense takes you just where it finds you. Each moment will become now as soon as you reach it. Therefore, the only thing to do is simply to look to Him now and believe now without reference to your past failures or your future hopes. The only starting point in the Christian life is now. The only point attainable is now. It is looking to Christ now. It is when you forget to live in the present moment by looking at that moment to Jesus Christ for grace and strength that you fail. That's such an important principle. The only important thing for Christian living is not what you did yesterday or what you promised for tomorrow. is what you're living right now. The failures of the past or the successes of the past don't really matter that much because now is the moment. The assurance of salvation and the possession of Christian character is a now activity, or it never will happen. Do we have the mind of Christ right now? A little more. It is the nature of a plant to turn toward the sun. But in God's spiritual garden, some plants try to grow in another way. There are some that try to grow by something inherent in themselves. Imagine a plant trying to make itself grow, exerting itself to become higher and stronger and or strike its roots more deeply into the soil. Yet, this is what many people think they must do in order to grow as Christians. A plant grows and reaches up and becomes stronger without any exertion on its own part. It simply looks to the sun. The whole process is simply an effort to get nearer to the source of life. You cannot grow by looking at yourself. You cannot grow by looking at other plants around you. All God wants of you is to let Him work in you. If you will look steadfastly at Him as the plant looks at the sun that shines in the heavens, if you will make it your constant effort to turn toward Him as the plant turns to its source of life and to reach up more and more toward the brightness of His face, then you will experience no difficulty in obtaining the full measure of growth that you desire. Whenever you fall into sin, whenever you fall into sin, it is because for that moment your faith has let go of the Lord and that that moment you are not believing in Him. It is a blessed truth that by faith you are shut in by the arms of the Lord and the evil one cannot touch you. Through faith you can be kept from the iniquity that surrounds you that is even in your very flesh ready to spring upon you. It is He that has pledged to keep you in the midst of the consuming fire of sin. You cannot endure it alone. You always fall, and the fiery darts strike into your soul. The prayer of David may be yours continually. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Well, just a little sampling. But that was the message that was designed to prepare God's people for translation over a hundred years ago. Would you turn with me to Colossians chapter 1? Colossians.
Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. I think that's about the same message that Elder Wagoner was trying to tell us in words of our time. Well, let's try a few other statements from inspiration as well. Mount of Blessing, page 114. God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which He sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness for sin, but reclaiming from sin. It is the outflow of redeeming love that transforms the heart. Did you notice that all of this is talking about forgiveness? David had the true conception of forgiveness when he prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Yes, God's forgiveness is declared. It is written in the books of heaven, but friends, it is more than that. And that's where modern theology has gone astray. It is reclaiming, it is transforming, it is renewing, it is a clean heart created within us. Do we feel it? No, but we believe it by faith. It is always by faith. And by the way, this is not sanctification. This is the power of forgiveness. This is justification, the renewal that happens. Justification transforms at the same time that it declares. Pardon is inward transformation. Well, here's another one, Christ Object Lessons. 163, as the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Notice, justification, justification is receiving a new heart from God. It is becoming a new creature, not sanctification. Right now, there's a major attempt being made to uh, separate the transforming power of the Holy Spirit from the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. To put transforming totally within the sphere of sanctification as a result of being saved. But what we are finding in these inspired statements and in the 1888 message is that transformation and making righteous are part of the justifying process. Not after, but at the moment of justification. After He transforms us, after He makes us righteous, then He declares us righteous and writes it in the books of heaven. Amen. Justification is simply another name for the new birth the new creation, the new heart. Don't ever separate them. That's the tragic mistake of modern theology. Separating the new birth from the saving act of justification. Another one, Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1098. By receiving His imputed righteousness through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, we become like Him. Now, we play around with these words, don't we? Imputed and imparted. Imputed is written, imparted is shared. And yes, they have those meetings. But I've noticed that inspired writers, and that includes Paul and Ellen White, don't always make such precise distinctions. Notice now in this sentence that imputed righteousness, which means credited righteousness, comes through the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. That's how you get to be called righteous when the transformation happens. Some today want to say that we are justified by Christ and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. My friends, nowhere does Scripture make that distinction between the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Both are involved in both justification and sanctification. It is so clear 
from inspiration that imputed means more than accounting and crediting. Another statement, Review and Herald, August 19, 1890. To be pardoned, now we're talking about pardon. To be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons is not only to be forgiven, but to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. The Lord says, a new heart will I give unto thee. The image of Christ is to be stamped upon the very mind, heart, and soul. To pardon means to renew. It's as simple as that. Let's not overcomplicate it. Let's not make fine distinctions. To pardon, to be forgiven, is to be renewed and to have a clean heart. Whenever we sin, we need pardon. We need a clean heart again. Elder Wagoner put it very simply in his book, Christ and His Righteousness, pages 51 and 57. To justify means to make righteous. Let us first have an object lesson on justification or the imparting of righteousness. And so I think I'd like to urge you to just remember that the 1888 message as given through these two messengers was out of harmony with the current understanding of justification in their time and in our time. You will not find that in the theological textbooks of today. It is not taught in the seminaries of today that way at all. They were totally opposite to the current, their current and our current understanding of how a person is saved. Could it be here that we're really dealing with two different Gospels? The Gospel of Jesus and Paul and Ellen White and the 1888 message versus the Gospel of of the reformers and the theologians of today. Could both be competing for our loyalty, both claiming that they will deliver salvation to us? My friends, Satan's counterfeit of the gospel is no less serious than his counterfeit of a day of worship, and maybe much more serious, because we feel saved when we're not saved at all. Selected Messages, page, Volume 1, page 366. But while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active, living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. What have we just read? Again, something totally contrary to modern theology. The entire surrender of the heart is clearly here a condition of salvation. The whole heart must be yielded to God with nothing held back. No little secret rooms in which we say, I'm keeping this one, Lord. I'll give everything else to you. We must decide not to continue in disobedience any longer. The decision is crucial. Then, to remain in a justified or saved state, the next condition is obedience. Ah, but notice that this obedience is not my efforts just all by myself, grit my teeth and try harder. It comes through faith in God's power to purify the soul. It really is all about faith. The decision to obey is always my decision. God doesn't make that decision for me. The power to obey is always God's power. Let's be sure we understand those two things. The two conditions to receiving and keeping justification are surrender and obedience. Without these conditions being met, there is no justification, no matter how much we may claim it. We are in serious danger of false presumption that I'm okay when I'm not, the counterfeit of genuine faith. But isn't this a subtle form of legalism, making obedience a part of justification? Does this mean that we are saved by faith and works somehow? Picture yourself at Cape Canaveral, watching a space shuttle launch into outer space. 
What's the basic cause of that shuttle going into space? It's the firing of the mighty engines, the rocket engines that force that ship out of our atmosphere. No matter how careful the preparations for launch, nothing will happen if those engines don't fire perfectly. If they do fire, per fire perfectly, the shuttle will be launched whether or not anybody is on board. Now, if the astronauts want to participate in this launch, they have to do a few things. They must don those cumbersome suits. I don't think that feels much like fun. I've never put one on, but I think. They have to get into the gantry elevator, take it to the top floor, walk carefully across the narrow catwalk, strap themselves into those comfortable seats in the shuttle, hoping that all will work well? Now, will any of those things cause the astronauts to go into space? Any of them? They can sit in those seats for three months and never go anywhere if the, if the engines don't fire. The various things that the astronauts must do to get into space are not the causes of space flight. They are the conditions of space flight conditions that must be met. They must comply with all of the conditions if they hope to travel in space. What if the astronauts decide that, boy, that's a lot of legalism. That's a lot of work I have to do. I'll sit in the bunker where it's nice and safe, and that's how I'll get there. It is rather obvious here that space flight involves both cause and condition if anyone is going into space. The astronaut simply fulfills the conditions are, that are necessary if he wants to be in the place where the space flight will happen, in the capsule with the engines firing. We must clearly understand the difference between cause and condition of salvation. The same in justification by faith. What is the cause of my justification? Is it surrender? Is it obedience? Is it church membership? We can obey perfectly for the next 50 years and not get ourselves one inch closer to salvation. It won't work. The only cause of justification is God's saving grace through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's the only cause of salvation the place of salvation. But if I do not comply with the conditions of salvation, surrender and the decision to obey God, then I refuse to place myself where salvation takes place. I'm in the bunker. I'm not on the space shuttle. There are conditions. You know what? According to our Bible, that space shuttle will lift off into space whether we are in there or not. The cause has been met. It will happen. It's only our decision as to whether we're here in the bunker or there ready to take flight. The death of Christ is and always will be the meritorious cause of our salvation, while surrender and obedience have no merit, no saving merit at all, but make it possible for the cause to save me. And without that condition, I can't be saved. Someone else might be, but I can't be saved without meeting that condition. Salvation is caused by grace alone, not by obedience. But obedience places me where the power of the cross can launch me into eternal life. That is, the, I think, the great failure of most Christian understandings of how salvation works. Failing to recognize that there are conditions to salvation which do not merit or cause us to be saved but without which there can be no salvation. That's a little nutshell of what that 1888 message was trying very hard to get across to us. Now we're going to focus on another aspect of this message which came to us well over 100 years ago. We always believed in righteousness by faith. We believed in justification. We believed in sanctification. I don't think there was ever a time when the Seventh-day Adventist pioneers did not believe 
that those were the essential parts of how to be saved. But you know what? Those beliefs had become a skeleton doctrine. A skeleton will hold up what is necessary to sustain life. But a skeleton is not the way I prefer to live my life. The skeleton, the basic skeleton of what justification is, what sanctification is, became flesh and blood, became filled with living power when a new emphasis was placed upon our Savior, Jesus Christ, faithful to God in fallen flesh. That was crucial to the 1888 message. Some people today try to say the 1888 message was all about just justification by faith and God's love and grace. No, it was more than that. Yes, there was a skeleton doctrine before that time, but from a new and living presentation of loyal to God in fallen flesh, a new comprehension of the intimate association with Jesus in our tempestuous and dangerous nature of fallen flesh, with pulls coming at us all the time seemingly impossible to resist. That Christ became the flesh and blood of the 1888 message. And here we have come to a point in our time in which strange things have happened. Almost total silence on that part of that message that came to us then. Upon the messages that Elder Jones and Elder Wagner and, yes, Ellen White gave in revivals that took place in the years following 1888 upon the victorious, incarnate life of Christ, loyal to God in fallen flesh. That's the way the loud cry began in that period of time. Decades of time went on. In fallen flesh became to be less accented, touched a little more lightly, hidden in gentle language. The study of the incarnate life in Christ in fallen flesh became His life in human flesh. And then it came to be his life in Adam's innocence. Slowly but surely, we conformed our verbal expressions to the theolog theolo theological presuppositions of those around us. Not that our apologists were insincere. They weren't disloyal. They were trying to uh, advance the sympathetic image of Jesus Christ our Savior, to gain a little communion with the people around us who misunderstood us and called us a sect. The intentions were as excellent, but the results were disastrous because all of a sudden that emphasis began to disappear. And finally, as tacitly it became understood that Christ did not come in the fallen heredity of Adam, a great hush descended upon the tremendous teaching of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. A fundamental truth began to be stated in equivocal English so that all could feel comfortable with the language. And just as far as that emphasis has disappeared from our Seventh-day Adventist teaching, so far has the doctrine of righteousness by faith again become a skeleton doctrine. Yes, we believe it. Yes, we understand it. Justification is declaring righteous. Justification is having your name written in the books of heaven. Sanctification and the new birth follow down the line somewhere. Just that far. When the warm, emotional appeal of a loving, compassionate Savior agonizing with the same struggles we agonize with, fighting off the same demons that we have to fight off, when that was lost, this doctrine became sterile and without power. Only as Jesus was one with us, a brother, a sympathizer in the inner pressures of human temptations, can he really be close to us, the elder brother, the, Lord, the Redeemer. To the degree that this stimulating and fundamental idea has been lost and clouded in these years, to that same degree, a vital channel of spiritual power has been lost to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that channel must be opened again. We must not let it disappear into the mists of history and just let it go. Now, why do I think that this is such an important topic? 
there are a couple of things that I want to share with you briefly tonight that I consider to be really, really vital. I'm going to start out with a statement that came from the Biblical Research Institute of our General Conference in the year 1989. Listen to the advice given to pastors around the Adventist world. The world church has never viewed these subjects as essential to salvation, nor to the mission of the remnant church. These topics need to be laid aside and not urged upon our people as necessary issues. Why do I not follow the advice that was given to us in 1989? Here are two reasons. When Satan first challenged God, what he challenged were God's laws. Angels don't need laws. We can figure out what's right and wrong. We've got good minds. We don't need these laws to regulate us. Because you see, if God's laws are faulty, then His governing system is faulty and His character is faulty. That was why He has first attacked God's law and why He continues to attack God's law. Take your Bible now. Let's see what Jesus came to accomplish when He came down to this earth. We often think it was His death on the cross. I think it's more than that. How about John chapter 8, verse 26? John chapter 8, verse 26. He said, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Can God be trusted? Is God fair? Is He merciful? Is He a tyrant? He that sent me is true. Maybe that was Jesus' real mission in coming down to planet Earth, to get the picture of God straightened out again so that people could trust Him, have faith in Him. Try another text. John 14. John 14, verse 10. He was having trouble with Philip. Philip was wanting to see the Father. Look what he said to Philip. John 14, 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. You want to see the Father, Philip? You want to know what God is really like up there in heaven? Look, here it is. This is the way the Father is. Look, Philip, please look. I'm suggesting that the real issue here is so much more than Jesus dying on the cross to save us. It is Jesus revealing and bringing His people back to faith in God, vindicating His Father's name. All right. Satan charged that God's law was unfair, God is unfair, God is not right. Now I'm going to ask you to listen very carefully to exactly what that charge was for us today. You will find it in Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 136. Satan, the fallen angel, had declared that no man could keep the law of God after the disobedience of Adam. He claimed the whole race under his control. What was his claim? Adam couldn't obey God? Is that his claim? No. That no man could keep the law of God after the disobedience of Adam. What kind of people having what kind of nature live after the disobedience of Adam? Fallen human beings with a fallen nature. That was his claim. Your law doesn't work. Fallen human, human beings can't obey you. Well, let's try another one. This is Signs of the Times, January 16, 1896. Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God. Now he's talking about you and me. It's impossible for you and me to keep the law of God. And thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. Not on Adam and Eve, not you and me, God. God is at fault. Jesus came... Jesus humbled Himself, clothing His divinity with humanity, that by both precept and example He could condemn sin in the flesh and give the lie to Satan's charges. 
I think that's what Jesus came to do, to prove Satan a liar, to give the lie to the charges he made. God isn't a just God. How do we know? Fallen human beings can't obey God's law. Jesus came to give the lie to that charge of Satan. Review and Herald, March 9, 1905. He came to this world to be tempted in all points as we are, to prove to the universe that in this world of sin, in this world of sin, human beings can live lives that God will approve. Satan declared that human beings could not live without sin. Wow, that's pretty clear and straightforward, isn't it? Satan says you can't live without sin. Jesus came to prove that you can live without sin. Who are you? You're a fallen human being with a fallen nature. Jesus came to prove that in this world of sin, human beings could live without sin. Another one, because this is probably the most misunderstood subject today in the Adventist church. Another one. This is Selected Messages, Volume 1, 252 to 256. After the fall of man, Satan declared that human beings were proved to be incapable of keeping the law of God. After the fall of man. Christ's humanity would demonstrate for eternal ages the question which settled the controversy. That's an important question. What is that? In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. That's the question that settled the great controversy. That's the question which proved that Satan was lying. Satan says fallen human beings cannot obey God's law. Jesus Christ would demonstrate for eternal ages the question which would settle the great controversy. He took himself upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition to say fallen nature can obey the law of God. All right. The only way that I know of that Jesus Christ can stand as the head and the representative of the human family, to be allowed to be man's representative in the courts of heaven, to stand as the second Adam, undoing all that the first Adam has done, the only way is if he proved Satan wrong in the great controversy and showed that God had been true all along. Only in that way could he be our substitute, dying in our place in our stead. Now, if Jesus Christ took Adam's unfallen nature, what would that prove? Well, that would prove that Adam and Eve and the angels and the unfallen beings could obey God. Wouldn't that be right? If he took a nature halfway like Adam and halfway like mine, what would that prove? That someone with a halfway nature like Adam and halfway like mine can obey God's law. That's what that would prove. The only way that he could prove that fallen nature can obey God's law is if he took fallen nature and obeyed God's law. It's not complicated. But because we have been hit hard with criticism from other theological circles, we have changed the simple into the complex. And we have divided the Adventist church. All men have sinned. Is Jesus the real answer? So I'm going to say that Jesus taking man's fallen nature was essential to his mission of becoming the second Adam and, and living and dying as our substitute so I can be saved. If he didn't do it, there is no Savior. No one has proved Satan wrong yet. I sure haven't, and I don't think you have either. Only Christ. Came across an interesting letter many years ago from Australia very thoughtful. Listen. Along, this was a letter written to the Adventist Review in the letters section. Along with two-thirds of the original number of angels, despite Satan's fiercest attempts to tempt and deceive them, despite their having only a partial knowledge of the nature and results of sin, not a single being in the many other inhabited worlds has yielded to sin and lost his right to eternal life. Isn't that right? Don't you think Satan exerted a lot of efforts, not only in the angels in heaven, but those other unfallen worlds? We're told there's a tree of knowledge on every, on every planet. And I am sure he exerted just as much effort there as he exerted here. But they didn't yield. Now the letter. If the Son of the Most High God 
had taken on human flesh just to prove that sinless beings with sinless natures can perfectly keep God's law, we would have had an infinite humiliation to prove the already and obviously proven. There could have been no greater, more costly, more tragic exercise in futility. Well, I thought that was very thoughtful. If he came to prove that Adam could have obeyed, and all the universe knew that angels have obeyed two-thirds of them and not one has fallen on all the other planets, then he would have proved the already proved and died an agonizing death to prove nothing more. Very important. So the first reason I believe that fallen nature is important is it is the only way for Christ to be our substitute. But I'll deal with one more briefly. Revelation chapter 14, verse 5. Revelation chapter 14, verse 5. And in their mouth, this last people, was found no guile, no deception, for they are without fault before the throne of God. An individual noted very astutely 60 years ago, those who teach that Christ took a superior human nature draw the logical conclusion that it is impossible for the rest of mankind to perfectly obey the law of Jehovah in this life. Well, that's dead on right. If he has a superior nature, that doesn't help me. I don't have that nature. If there is going to be 144,000, if there's going to be a final generation who live after the close of, of probation with no sin in their lives, then we need some evidence to back it up. Yes, we've got these promises in the Bible, but you know, I need a little more proof. I'm a skeptical human being. Do these promises really work? Is there any flesh and blood proof? A review in Herald, May 7, 1901. Christ kept the law, proving beyond controversy that man also can keep it. There's our proof. I don't have proof in you. I don't have proof in me. I have proof only in Jesus Christ. And then this incredible statement in volume 7 of the Bible commentary, 929, from Ellen White. In our conclusions, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. The whole Christian world has done that, and we have followed in their steps. We have destroyed the completeness of Jesus Christ. So I say, Jesus Christ coming in fallen flesh is essential to the success of of the great plan of salvation, and it is essential to the success of the final generation living a life that seems impossible. Both are essential parts of this process. Without them, it's not going to happen. Manuscript Releases, Volume 6, page 340 and 341. We are ever to be thankful that Jesus has proved to us by actual facts that man can keep the commandments of God, giving contradiction to Satan's falsehood that man cannot keep them. If Christ had a special power, which it is not the privilege of man to have, Satan would have made capital of the matter. What's a special power? How about a perfect nature? How about a perfect nature which isn't even thinking of selfishness or pride or, or lying or any of those things? When obedience is as natural as breathing, that's a special power. In the same one, when we give to his human nature a power that is not possible to have, we destroy, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. And then this marvelous statement from the youth's instructor, October 13, 1898. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. What did I just start with in this little short presentation? This study should not, should not be our focus. We should lay this subject aside. I can't do that, brothers and sisters. It is too crucial. It is too vital to all of God's plan of salvation to lay it aside. couple of things that I want to share with you right here. 
The only thing that's important in these last days is the name and the character of God. We need to know that this is what is important for us today and will be in the future. And from a person who understood these things well over 50 years ago, he said all this is closely connected with the work of the Day of Atonement. On that day, the people of Israel, having confessed their sins, were completely cleansed. They had already been forgiven. Now sin was separated from them. They were holy and without blame. The camp of Israel was clean. We are now living in the great antitypical day of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Every sin must be confessed and by faith be sent beforehand to judgment. As the high priest enters into the most holy, so God's people now are to stand face to face with God. They must know that every sin is confessed, that no stain of evil remains. And then this sentence... The cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven is dependent upon the cleansing of God's people on earth. How important then that God's people be holy and without blame. In them every sin must be burned out so that they will live in the sight of God and with the devouring fire without sin. And that's really what I think it's all about. That's really why we're dealing with this subject that's why we're focusing today and tomorrow on, th on subjects that are controversial and divisive, so-called, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to finish up, because this is about the 1888 message, with Elder Jones' appeal at a general conference. Now remember, this is speaking to the leaders of the Adventist Church. And I want you to hear how he appealed to them at that time. He said, the mystery of God is God manifest in the flesh. The finished mystery of God is the completion, the perfection of the manifestation of God in the flesh in the believers of Jesus who belong to the church. Thus, there are two places occupied by the finishing of the mystery of God. One place is the world itself to which the gospel is to be preached. The other place is the lives of the believers of the truth. Now listen. We might preach and proclaim in words to the ends of the earth, to every soul on earth in our generation, so that phase of the work would be completed and would be finished. Yet if the manifestation of God in the lives of those who preach that is not completed also, we could preach that thing 10,000 years and the end would never come. That's pretty dramatic language. Which is why I go back to saying our mission is not primarily to take the gospel to the world. That is the Holy Spirit's mission through the latter rain and the loud cry, and we cooperate with it. Of course we do. But we also noted that our leaders said, we're not getting there. Nothing that we are doing is taking the gospel to the world in this generation. So what is going to do it? Elder Jones was focusing on this very point. It is not simply that the gospel shall be preached to all the world and fill all the world, but it is when that is done, there shall be a people ready to meet him. Without the finishing of that manifestation of God in the flesh of each believer, there can be no finishing of the mystery of God. That mystery finished, God manifest in the flesh, mark it, means that only God is to be seen in every act of the life of the believer so that in his life God is manifested. Only that is finishing the mystery of God in the way that it counts. Whenever anyone looks at you or at me, they see Jesus Christ. They see his character. They see it on our countenance. They see it in our words. They see it in our actions. And we are not doing it to earn our way to heaven. We are doing it because we have been transformed by the power of justification. And that is the way the finishing of the mystery happens. He continues. And you know that if that way were wide open and God were to take possession and fill the lives of the 75,000 professed believers today, that's how many they had, 75,000 in the whole world, it would be the easiest thing in the world to reach all the nations so that the end should come. Wow, how about that? If, he would, if we would allow God to fill us so completely that every act of our life, it would be easy. Didn't 12 do it and maybe 70 extra in the first century? Could 75,000 do it in Ellen White's time? What about us today? 
The finished mystery of God is the finishing of the growth, the manifestation of Christ in the believer, so that we shall stand in this world in the image of Jesus Christ, reflecting only Him, that when the believer shall be seen, only Christ will be seen. Everything that is said, everything that is done, every tone of the voice, all that we are will tell only of Christ. Only that is the finishing of the mystery of God in truth, in the way that it counts, and that is what has to come before the end can come. I think that's the seal of God. Revelation 7. That's the seal of God. Well, he had a little more to say. One last little thing. Any preaching of the sanctuary, any study of the sanctuary, any proclamation of the sanctuary. Have we been proclaiming the sanctuary? Yes, we have. In books and articles and sermons. Since the days of Desmond Ford, we have been proclaiming it even more strongly. We have good evidence for 1844 and the beginning of the judgment. Any preaching of the sanctuary that does not preach and proclaim the finishing of transgression in the life of him who preaches it, that does not mean and manifest itself in the making an end of sins in his life, that does not bring everlasting righteousness into the life of him who is preaching, is not preaching the message of the cleansing of the sanctuary at all. The messenger leaves out the very thing that the angel of God in presenting it makes the substance of the whole story. Yet brethren are in this audience. Remember who he's preaching to? Leaders of the general conference. Yet brethren are in this audience today who know of men who could run the gamut of the 2300 days, giving by rote every chapter and every verse, yet who did not know in their lives the finishing of transgression, that did not know the making an end of their sins, who had no everlasting righteousness brought in to keep them back from sinning. You know that that is so. Then that kind of preaching of the sanctuary and of its cleansing will never bring the cleansing of the sanctuary and will never bring us to the end. No, sir. There is a cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. That is true. And while that is going on in heaven, yet if that is not also done in the saints and believers on the earth, then that cleansing of the sanctuary can never end. We never could, in that case, come to the end of the world. So the cleansing of the church of the saints on earth must keep equal pace, must be exactly in proportion with the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven, or that church will not be up to date. Wow. That's 1888, my friends. That's the message which came. And by the way, it's a misnomer. It's the 1890s message that they preached for years after 1888 that's crucially important. And this message was the message of preparation for the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Is the 1888 message important? Yes, I say it is. And I suggest we study it with a renewed emphasis on how to prepare for that seal of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have neglected all of us, this message, in one way or another, help us to end that neglect. May we restudy, rethink, and recommit ourselves to that message which was to end the great controversy over 120 years ago, and yet we are still struggling. May we not make the same mistake of those leaders in that time and cast it aside. May we say, yes, Lord, this time, in Jesus' name, amen.